Okay, I think we can start. Um, so, um, Doug, you mentioned that, you know, um, someone from IBM is going to, um, I mean, Olive, yes. Olivia. Yes. Okay, sorry. Olivia, yeah, yes. Okay, good. Hi. Uh, okay, so let's, um, so let's go through this agenda. I think uh, now first, uh, um, I think today we're going to do the presentation and then we're going to go through the review comments. I see that now he wrote, wrote some uh, review comments which we can discuss. Okay, so let's first uh, start with the presentation. Um, I'm going to start first uh, um, to talk about uh, function graph. Let's share my screen. Okay, here's some 18 minutes. So maybe um, if someone can help, right? I'm going to write the meeting minute, but if someone else can help writing it, that would be good. Um, let me slide show. Can you see my slide? Yep. Okay. So in function graph model, so it's like it's uh, this uh, function workflow is naturally modeled as a state machine. There are three elements in the function graph. Um, so one is a list of event triggers. That's like uh, the cloud events, for example, could be storage event, HTTP event, or any other media streaming event, you know, database access event, email event, code repo, update event, any event. Okay, this is just like some example. And then besides event trigger, there will be some list of states. So we have, you know, five uh, states, one called event state, operation state, switch state, delay state, and state. Yeah, I'm going to go through them later. I mean, in more detail in later slides. And then there are also functions, or we call you can call it actions associated with the state. For example, in the event state, if one event comes, it's going to trigger some function. And this function will, you know, um, in the function, you know, it could like some primitive say, you know, it's parallel execution of these functions or it's sequential execution or it's branching execution. And then there will be could be retry mechanism if the function fails versus a retry mechanism. And then also like some information passing from the from the you know between the functions or from the previous function to the next function. So these are the um, three um, key elements of the um, workflow. So and on the right side is just a diagram of that, you know, that workflow. Um, just example diagram. So um, let's go to this. Um, first is, uh, let's see the list of states. Um, uh, we have, you know, um, as mentioned before, we have uh, five states. Event states is used to wait for events from event sources. So this event source could be any event source, uh, as mentioned before. Um, and then, you know, when that event comes, it's going to invoke one or more functions to run in either sequence or in parallel. Um, so it could be, uh, the event could be multiple events, not just one event, could be end or relationship of this event. So it could be say, you know, when event one comes or event two comes, then, you know, this function need to be executed. Or it could be a end event, say, when both event comes and that function, a specific function is triggered. So that's the event state. And then there's operation state. So the difference between event state, operation state is that, you know, Operate state does not need to be triggered by any event. So when it goes to that step, then it just uh, automatically one or more functions will run either in sequence or in parallel, um, but without waiting for any event. Um, the other part are the same to the event state. Only difference is it's not triggered. Those functions are not triggered by any event. And then there's a switch state. This state permits the transition to other states um, you know, based on different conditions. For example, could be, you know, the previous steps function execution result, uh, you know, different function execution result in the previous step, previous step or previous state will trigger, you know, the branching to different next states. Or could be, you know, the other, some other condition too. Um, and then there's a delay state. This is just, uh, you know, causes the workflow execution to delay for a specific duration or until a specific time or date. Um, this is very simple, this delay state. End state, this state determines a workflow with some either failure or success status. So when the workflow ends, it's going to go to the end state. It could end with a successful um, 
on execution of the workflow or with a failure execution of the workflow. So these are the states. And then these are the event triggers. So event triggers, we have um, three, um, three parameters. One is the event source. It could be the cloud, you know, it could be any event source. This is same as a, a cloud event source. And then will be an event ID, and then will be the filter applied to the um, to the cloud event to get the required information, which you know will be passed to the next, um, which will be part could be passed to the function. Okay, so this is filter on the payload or on the it could be on the payload or on the other you know metadata information um, on the cloud events, and then the, after the filter, the information will be passed to the function or could be passed to the next st state. So the trigger name is the name of the events. Um, and this name will be used by the event expression in the event state. So when the, in the event state, uh, when we say, okay, event one, or called event, for example, like motion event. So that's an event name. That event name is defined in here. This is the event name, trigger name. Um, and then the other information will decide in the event itself. So when we go to the event state, the event state does not deal with the detail of the event. It only reference the event name. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think that that's about it. You know, the filter I already uh, mentioned about that. And the event ID is a cloud event ID. Um, Kathy, just, just a quick question. The filter, does that operate just on the cloud event properties or can it also filter information within data? Yeah, it within data. It could be both. Could okay. Be, yeah. Okay, um, yeah. Good. So um, the function. Okay. So event. So now I'm going to go through the the each event. So for the event state, we're going to the you know this state name. There will be a type. So for this type event state, the type will be event. If it's a, a operational state, the type will be. Let me go to the next one. So then the type. You see this this parameter. This type will be operation. And then if for the switch state, the type will be, no, not this one. The type will be switch. So let me scroll back. So it just, this type just basically what kind of state it is. It will have five different types of state. And then the, the, the start boolean mean that with a, that specific with a, this is a start state or is a, a intermediate state. So if it's a start state, this will be set to true. So the workflow could start with, with a event state or could start with the operation state. It could be any, except the end state. It could start with any state. And then, so for the event state, a key part is that, you know, uh, because this event state specified what event triggers what function at that specific uh, step. So we, need, we will define what events Will trigger that function. So here there's an event expression, it's a Boolean expression of the events. And then there's an action mode which defines the function. Basically, this is a function mode. Is it synchronous or asynchronous? The function. So if there are multiple functions, we can see these actions means the functions. The function, you know, there will be, it could be an array of functions. So if there are like more than one functions, are they going to execute it in sequence or in parallel? This is defined in the action mode. And then, of course, will be the next state, which means after this event state, function execution completes. What is the next state to transition to? Okay, this is the event state. And then, you know, go to the next operation state. So the only difference between this and the event state is that it doesn't need an event trigger. So there's no definition of the events of the event trigger. Here, the type is operation start. Again, it could be a it could be the start state. So. If it's true, it's a start state. Otherwise, it's not the start state. Um, that is the same thing as before. There's an action mode, which is synchronous, asynchronous, and then the actions is a sequence of, uh, I mean, it's a list of functions. That will be, that will be, that will run in this state, and then will be the next state. And here is, remember, in the previous two state, whether it's event state or action state, we have this action definition. So this is the function definition. Um, 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 you know, there's an action mode, which is synchronous, asynchronous, which defines whether these two or more function will execute in sequence or in, uh, in synchronous or in asynchronous mode. And then this action definition defines the detail uh, actions. 
Um, so here is the action definition. We have the function name that specifies. This is again, is a action definition could be an array of action definition, array of actions. Uh, so each action will specify what's the function name, what is the timeout value, and then um, what is the retry mechanism. Like you know, when you match, so when the function returns something, so match some result value, which is you know when the function's result, you match that result, and then what is the retry interval what is maximum retry, and that was the next state for each retry um, to go to. Um, so, yeah, that's that's about it. And then the switch state is like, a, you know, it's like a switch, you know. So you match, again, type is switch, putting this could be the start state too. And then trace is like, you know, what you do, so that's what specify. So, for example, we got uh, this, Pay, okay, this tries could depend on the different event, um, event data or event uh, information or the function result information. So then we need to uh, apply a, a filter. This a path is basically like a path, payload path. So which field will be used as a match to this value? Here there's a value. Because, you know, for example, if this event, right, it has a lot of information, the event payload has a lot of information or there'll be many, multiple event metadata information. So which field we are going to use to do the, uh, to do the matching. So this part specify that, um, that, that part. Uh, and then the value specify whether you, you know, what value you to, to match. So you match, so this trace is, is a, a kind of like a, a, a list array, right? So different, you match different value, you are going to do this is a comparison operator. For example, you say this value is equal to this value or larger than this value or smaller than this value. And then you match different value, you are going to switch to different next state. Now, of course, if you don't match anything, then what's the next state? What's the state to transition to? So this is at the right side said, you know, does a match and then go to the next different next state. And then in the next state, it's going to execute different functions. Um, that's about it. Uh, it's just, you know, this just uh, um, the way to model the workflow. So different types of uh, um, workflows can be modeled using all these, um, um, these events, um, come back to the original. Use this, you know, different states and then the events. Uh, so one point which I, you know, I, have, I haven't got time to add it yet is about the, um, the correlation, for example, um, in the, so the here, there are multiple events, right? So when this event comes, how we correlate, you know, this event one, this event one instance and this event two instance will go to the same workflow instance. So we need a correlation and that can be defined at the very be at the beginning of the workflow. So um, I, uh, I didn't, you know, have time to put in the slide yet, but if you go to the, uh, um, I, I can put that in later. Um, that's about it. Any questions or any anything which you think will not be able to support the workflow which we identify in the, the use cases or the workflow functionality we identify in the spec? This is Rachel. It seems like it's a pretty thought out way of like what you need. It's like a great, um, it's a great statement of like what we need to be able to support. And this seems like a very, uh, like it's a specific use case, but it's very generalizable. Like everyone will need to do these kinds of things. So I appreciate you like walking us through this. Okay, great. Thank you for the comment. I'm just writing down. Okay, great. Any other comments? Okay, I think you know probably you know you can um yeah you can you know 
I'm going to put the slide in some, I mean, some place, and then you can go through it again. And then, you know, um, if I have any comments, I'm going to put this inside the document too. So you can feel free to post it. Um, we have gone through, I have gone through this, you know, we have gone through this uh, multiple times. I think, you know, it's generic enough to support um, this, um, or this functionality. Um, of course, you know, there are still quite some, there are some details, right? Um, which, you know, uh, it's, you know, it's hard to, um, to really dive into, to go through in the, I mean, in this uh, short time period. But the high level idea is, is you know, is, is here. Um, okay, if that's, if no questions, I'm going to hand it over to, um, to Olivia. Um, let me um, do this. So let me, so are you going to share something, Olivia? Yes, or? yeah, a few slides as well. Okay, so, so let me, um, let me yeah, let me stop sharing. Um, I can share Yeah. this, share screen, then I can make that bigger. Yes, can you see the full screen slides at this point? Yes. yes. And can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, hi, I'm Olivier. I'm uh, with IBM Research and I'm an open risk contributor. And I'd like to tell you, yes, a little bit about what we're doing with, uh, let's say, workflow in open risk. As you notice, we call them composition, not workflows. And you'll see there are some, some differences that will be clear uh, after this talk, hopefully. So, uh, because it's a bit different, I, before telling you what we do, I'd like to tell us a little bit about why we do things the way we do them. And so here's a list of goals or things we're trying to accomplish. So of course, we're trying to build workflows or compositions of functions. And there are several important things in our view when we do that, you know, starting from, you know, uh, maybe non-controversial ones to more controversial ones. So first we want things to be polyglot. So we want functions to be expressed in you know, many different programming languages. We want compositions as well to, be, to make it possible to express in many different uh, programming languages. We care a lot about the costs, the billing. So what that means is we want to have an architecture, want to have a system and a programming model where the cost of the composition is pretty much the cost of the thing you compose. Of course, you know, you're making some choices, you're making some decisions, but these are typically very, very, very cheap computations. So that should be reflected by the fact that we can run composition pretty much at the cost of the component. Uh, one thing that's really important to us is what I call substitution. Uh, you can think of that as meaning that functions and compositions should be totally interchangeable. So for instance, if I have a client application that calls into a function. If I later decide that this function is just too simple and I want to replace it by a composition, I can do that in my library. The client doesn't have to change. From the point of view of the client, this is exact same API to call a function or a composition. In particular, in OpenWiz, we can call functions in a synchronous manner, in a blocking manner, where we say call the function and wait for the result and get the result. So that should also work with compositions. So uh, that means, for instance, that doing just even driven asynchronous composition doesn't quite get it for us. Uh, another, you know, something related to that is as a function runs in our system, it doesn't have to know whether it's just called by a client or called by an enclosing composition. You're not, nothing changes from the point of your function. Maybe the function uh, might want to know and, you know, do some things according to that, but it doesn't have to know. In principle, it just works. No, the, the, the big thing about our approach is that we very much believe in structured programming. We think that, uh, you know, uh, in a sense that, you know, describing workflows or compositions as graphs, as, you know, vertices and edges is great for discussing them, it's great for displaying them, it's great for documenting them, but necessarily great for actually programming complex behaviors. In the same way, we think that you know, YAML may be a great uh, configuration language, but it's not a programming language. So what we want to do is to get something much closer to the traditional programming experience of composing functions, in a, you know, outside of the cloud in the tra traditional environment. That means we want to do things like sequences, conditional loops. We want to be able to have nested compositions, compositions that calls into composition, that calls into composition. We want to do structured error handling. I'm putting parallelism and concurrency here as well because this is something we're working on. Also, we have not released this in open source, so I'm not going to talk about it much. But that's definitely part of the part of the goals. Uh, while we're very opinionated about you know the way we think is the best way to express compositions, 
we think the runtime on the other end should not be opinionated at all. It should be completely open-minded. It should, you know, contain as little as possible of the choices we have in program model. It should be as flexible as possible. So it should support, you know, running compositions, but, you know, in a very, very, very uh, program model agnostic manner. And uh, I, I'll show you that in a few slides. Uh, before I go, I also would like to, to add two things here. Uh, important again not, not going to talk much about it because we're working on it but it's it's really in the back of our mind and really dictates uh, some of the decisions we've made already the first one is you know we don't think the end goal is to actually compose function we believe the end goal is to compose cloud services you know whatever uh, databases uh, you know uh, uh, ai services etc cetera, etc cetera. and of course functions have a place in there because they they can be great for bridging gaps between services. But at the end of the day, the, the, the workflow, the composition is a few functions and lots of other things. And this is what we eventually want to support. The last thing is we believe events are really, really important, uh, whether it's correlation or streaming. And, and, and there, I think it's been discussed quite a bit in, in this uh, uh, call already or in previous calls. Uh, the tricky question is, as we try to make uh, things, as we try to express more things, we also make things more complex and it's hard to know exactly where to stop. And this is something we're working on. Okay, so if we have, so as I said before, we want to start with a pretty high level language and go down to pretty simple runtime in infrastructure. You can think of it as a risk processor. And so how do we do that? Well, you know, how, how we traditionally do that, we essentially start with high level code. We do some something that akin to a compiler. We compile this to an intermediate representation. This is what we run, right? So that means there are two components to what we've done. One so far is a Node.js library, which you use to program compositions. We also have a Python library, but it's not open source yet. And I'll show you the Node.js library in the next slides. And the second one is an extension to the open web with runtime that essentially does two things. The first one is it knows how, how to build dynamic chains of, of functions, right? Uh, we had sequence actions in OpenWiz before, but you had to define the sequence beforehand. So here's the key difference is that the way we were, as you run things, you can decide what to run next and what to run next and what to run next and when to stop. The second thing is that we also believe that state is important and uh, the runtime has to do some uh, state management, at least a little bit of it. So here's what a composer looks like. So uh, on the left, you have a very simple example of a composition described in the composer programming language. So here in this simple example, we're building a translator from an unknown language to English. And the way we do that is by composing two functions. The first one is language ID. It detects, uh, the, you know, it tries to guess the language of a fragment of text. And then there's a translator function that uh, translate from a given input language to a given output language. And as you can see, this composition is uh, start mixing things. It has two things in particular here. So one is it has a sequence, not just the sequence of the two functions, but also some, some inline function in between that, you know, take the output of the first function and, and put it in shape so that it can be the input for the next function. And it's also wrapped by a big try catch block because language ID might fail to detect the language. And in that case, we want to produce a human readable error message. All right, what you see on the right is something or tooling can build a graphical representation of this composition, but uh, that can be used for debugging, monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. But the ground truth is the code on the left. This is what you write, this is what you version control, this is what you, you know, edit in your editor. So uh, we have a bunch of constructs like that. There's a longer list, but here's the, really the basic stuff. Essentially, you can have functions, you can have sequences, you can have conditional, you can have a loop, uh, try catch kind of things you can declare variables you know and other things and parallel is add you know adds to the list finally these kind of things so um, yes yeah, so that's pretty much what I want to tell you about the program language you've seen the the example before and again if you look at this at this slide you can it's pretty clear that you can do the same thing in any kind of programming language the inline function syntax will change from one language to another but essentially everything else can be the same um, so uh, one thing I'd like to so so the way this works is, is an extension of the notion of data flow and sequences. So in principle, when you have a, one function executes after another function, that means the output of the previous functions becomes the input of the next function. That's that's the basic flow. Uh, 
But on top of that, there's a notion of state in this composition, right? Which is composed of a few things. The first one is where you are in the composition. Think of it as a program counter, right? Or, you know, if you think of finite state machines, this would be the, the, the actual state you're at in the composition. But there's more than that because we're doing structure programming so we have things like register exception handler we have things like variable declaration and so these need to be carried through by our runtime implementation additionally the user can even add some notion of state that could be added there so for instance a callback to invoke at the very end of the execution of the composition so we can support these kind of things so the what really key about this state is that um, what what's really needs to be managed is the state id and the state can be either inside the runtime, outside of the runtime, it doesn't matter. What, what we believe is the right thing to do with serverless is to keep state inside the runtime if it's small enough, right? If we can manage it for cheap. And if you really have, start having a lot of state, then you have to, uh, uh, the user has to help. You have to provide, you know, storage solution for your, for your, for your state. And then we're only going to manage the, the keys to your state. Okay, so how is this implemented? This is implemented using a mechanism called conductor action, which is the extensions we made to the open with runtime. And essentially it's the idea that an, a function, I mean, again, in open with we call functions actions, but same thing. So a function, instead of returning a final result, can return a triplet consisting of a pointer to an action, parameters and states. And which means that rather than this being the end of the execution, it means that the runtime system should now take the specified action, invoke it on the specified parameter, and that should be the next step of your composition. And when this next step of the composition is done, we should go back to the conductor action, which you can think of the scheduler in all this, and then reinvoke the scheduler with the combination of what was obtained from executing the component action, the results, and the state that needed to be preserved while the action was running. Right. So at the bottom, you have a handwritten conductor action. So we're not encouraging you to do this, but you can write a conductor actions by hand. It's a kind of a finite state machine. And what it essentially does, it's a two, it, it builds a sequence with two steps. In the first one, we, we call a function called triple. In the second one, we call a function called increments. And if you look at the you know, what, what that means at runtime, that means we start running this conductor action, this scheduler, it returns that we should run triple first, so triples run, then it's being reinvoked, now it's at state one, so that means it decides that the next step is increment, go run increments, then returns, and then uh, there's no more action to run, so this is the end of the, this is the end of the execution, this is the end of the pipeline. So, uh, putting all of this together, what that means is we have a library that generates a JSON representation for the composition. So it's not a finite state machine. It's something, I'll, I'll show you an example in the next slide, it's something much closer to an abstract syntax tree. So something very close to what was the syntax of the composition in the first place. Then what we do is we take this JSON composition, we combine it with a piece of code that is a, essentially a scheduler that is going to be the body of the action. It's the same for all of our composition. It doesn't change, only the JSON changes. And then this produces a conductor action. And this is the thing that the runtime system uh, executes. And the way this is executed, if you, if you, if you again, want to know the details, that first it translates this abstract syntax tree through something like a finite state machine, and then it interprets the finite state machine. But one big difference with all of the things that have been discussed so far is that this finite state machine is really an internal representation of the runtime system. It can change, and it's definitely not uh, the, the representation that typically your user programs with to describe a composition. So, uh, you know, this is the JSON. So uh, maybe at that level, it doesn't look that different, but you can see here, this is a JSON for the example code I had before. It has a first, you know, the, the root node is a try cat, is a as type try, it has a body and a handler. The body itself is a sequence, which has, which has a few components. These components is an array of things. Some of them are named actions. Some of them are inline functions, et cetera, et cetera. So that's about it. And uh, just going back to the goals. So just, just, just a couple of comments here. I've, I've been, I, I missed the last, the previous two calls and I hope I'll be able to join more of these calls. Uh, but I listened to the recordings and I understand from Kathy that the, uh, the, the goal of the work group is to primarily try to define the user facing representation. You know, what, what the user, how is the user going to program a workflow? And I feel maybe that's a bit premature, 
I would be, you know, like if I think in my view, what the cloud event specification is doing is, is, is a much more bottom up. It's trying to tackle uh, and decide the kind of infrastructure we can have in common in our runtime systems so that they can collaborate and uh, work together much more effectively. So the reason I'm thinking it's a bit more premature is because I think there are a lot of, lot of options, a lot of different ways to do these workflows. And I'm not sure we have, you know, we have, uh, we know already which, what are the good ones, the better ones. And on the other end, I think from the runtime perspective, we start to understand the kind of additions we need to make uh, to make it possible to just run any kind of workflow, any kind of programming models, whether you like finite state machines, you like, you like structured programming, you like declarative programming. I think uh, we should be able to agree on some of the key components of the runtime system. We need to support that. That's it for me. Any questions? So I'm curious, you, if you think that defining the user facing model for lack of a better phrase is a little premature, what would be your recommendation on the first baby step towards heading down to finding a workflow? So, I, I think I think the I think having said that, the work group is doing the, the right thing, which is to look at use cases, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so, so to understand exactly how what are the primitive capabilities that we need. So, for instance, again, as I said in this presentation, I didn't really talk about parallelism and concurrency, or or very much about events. So, I think these are key things to understand, and the way to understand them is to go through you know, what are the use cases? And, you know, using finite state machine for that makes perfect sense. But I, I think then we, sh we should, rather than maybe shooting for a holistic definition of what are all the, all the states we can have in the finite state machines, maybe it should be more of what are the different kind of building blocks? Like we need fork, maybe we need join, we need, you know, I, I, I really like to think of this as defining the risk processor for the cloud, where we define the minimal instruction sets and I feel like the, maybe the approach of defining this finite state machine is, is, is trying to do at the same time understanding what the, what the backend infrastructure has to be, what's the, what the primitive or the risk infrastructure is, but at the same time is also trying to be the user facing, the user facing um, program model. I think, I think, I mean, in, in my experience, it, it makes a lot of sense to not confuse the user facing program model and the system representation or this, you know, the system abstraction, because, because, you know, they, they, yes, at the end of the day, one is supposed to be able to execute everything, but uh, they, they tend to have, they have very different goals, right? One is to, the goal of the user facing one is to be user friendly, is to be easy to understand, easy to refactor, etc. Lots, lots of different things. The goal of the system level one is to be minimal in particular. I think. Thank you. Um, so I think you know uh, it's important to separate the. I agree. It's important to separate the the front end user specification of the workflow with you know how back end is going to implement it to support that workflow. So I, I think I agree with your point on that. So that's why, you know, I don't think, you know, we should, you know, really go into how, uh, you know, the service platform should, you know, uh, should should schedule the container or should, you know, do the runtime to support that workflow. I think, you know, it's important to provide a way for the use to specify its desired um, application workflow. So that's why, you know, let's go to this uh, workflow spec, right? Um, we have discussed these use cases, you know, um, uh, in last uh, meeting. Uh, so all these use cases, uh, I think, you know, using the, it's actually when you look at these use cases, right? From user's point of view, it is a, a, a kind of like a, a state machine based workflow. So the user doesn't need to know the detail of, you know, the runtime or, you know, the detail of, you know, how you are going to run the, you know, to schedule the resource to support the function. The user want to know it just, you know, what the user would like to, the user needs to pass, in, pass you know, its desired application and specification to the service platform. You just say, okay. At this step, you know, what event trigger my function, or maybe there's no event trigger that function, that function just start to run, and then, you know, whether it's going to branch out or what. So I think actually, from a user's perspective, a state machine-like uh, representation of, <clears throat> of the application 
is a way to go rather than you know we're pulling very complicated um I, I understand and i think it makes sense but i think it's also a very opinionated we a very opinionated view of how to program so in my experience for instance finite state machines and things very directly inspired for fine from finance machines are very familiar to hardware programmers or hardware designers and they, they use that a lot. They like it a lot. I think it's much less the case for, you know, uh, application, traditional application programmers. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So that, that's different opinion. But, uh, you know, the, the model, I think, you know, um, um, which, you know um, which I presented, I don't think it's a, a real strict, it's a real strict financing machine. It is not. It's just a statement. Model the one. Um. Um, it is not really a finite state machine uh, to be strict. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, when I say finite state machine, I'll also mean something vaguely, you know, that resembles a finite state machine, yes. But I think, for instance, uh, some of the questions there, if you, if you look at finite state machines, in particular, the people that do, you know, graphical representation, or graphical design languages for finite state machines, they often fail to address the problem of hierarchical composition. Which is how you get, you know, in finite state, uh, how you build larger, you know, automata or finite state machine from smaller ones. What's the what's the what's the semantics for composing them? In particular, what's the what's the um, uh, error semantics when you start composing these things? Uh, how do you what does it mean to abort one of these things? I think that that that's that's finite state machines make a lot of sense, you know as long as they fit on your screen and and we start having complexity that goes beyond that they become much much harder to to manipulate yeah maybe ah. maybe if you can comment in detail like you know which part or which functionality it cannot support i think that's more um useful uh, rather but, than but 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 yes I no i sure so so yeah, so then helpful. then my take then my take is when well, when you build, what I'm trying to say here is, sure, maybe uh, we can get to finite state machine specification that 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 does everything, right? That does that covers all the bases we want to cover. But then I think in that case, you could have a much much simpler specification of what it is, right? You you could you could you could you could simplify this to uh, to a, a fewer fewer primitives, right? So. Let, let me pick on AWS, for instance, uh, rather than Huawei, uh, you know, the Amazon state language. They de define lots, lots, lots of different ways of doing uh, retries, lots of ways to handle errors, because it makes sense. Because from a user's perspective, one of the values of using Amazon step functions is you have lots of policies by which you can decide what to do if something goes wrong. Right. So that I think that was even the maybe the drive the driver behind the you know uh, having uh, step functions in the first place, uh, and and so that's really important for the user. But when you think about it, lots of these mechan many of these mechanisms have a lot in common, right? And uh, the primitives you need to implement these mechanisms are things like try catch, looping, counting. Right. So if you can support counting, looping, and 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 catching errors. Then you can express all of these versions of the mechanisms with back off. You know, you need delays as well, as you as you pointed out in your presentation. But you can describe all these policies with exponential back off, with n retries, with retry for one minute, etc., etc., etc. All of them you can express as uh, as you know derived construct on top of these primitive constructs. So so maybe this is this is what we end up doing. But I think I would be I would be very very reluctant. To try to go and 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 list and and uh, you know make make, make and try to make an exhaustive list of all the possible ways we can recover from error, because I think this is wrong. So um, thanks very much for the demo and example. Um, what you were talking about and the difference between the language representation. It looks like you have Python coming and JavaScript right now, yes. and the underlying like. Um, underlying representation of how to process these things. Um, yes. Reminds me a lot of the way that internally at Google, Borg has a very complex protocol buffer that expresses how you should run things. Um, but then there are higher level tools that actually compile down to that. Um, and everyone uses the higher level tools and no one you know, yes. actually goes and wrestles with the underlying protocol buffers. Um, 
I was wondering, is that underlying representation for composer well, um, like standardized or well-defined somewhere? Yeah, so I mean, so uh, again, there are two aspects to it. The first one is the JSON representation, the one that essentially gets uploaded to, uh, you know, gets deployed to mm -hmm. OpenMIS Control Cloud. That, that is well-defined. I mean, again, the documentation is work in progress, but the intent is for that to be specified, well-defined, uh, fixed, uh, or, um, you know, monotic, monot well, we add stuff to it. We add more capabilities, maybe, but uh, we this is this is backward compatible. Mm -hmm. Now, the the you know at runtime we end up uh, building a finite state machine out of that representation. That, on the other hand, is not uh, intended to be a stable representation. This is something, for instance, we continue to optimize, and so we don't want to commit to a, a specific representation because we 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 change it as we make it more efficient. For instance, the, the contract is that JSON. The contract is as JSON, yes. Yeah. Yes. And you can write any tool, you know, if you want to come in as and have a community contribution that generates JSON from something else, you can. Right. Um, so I, I would like to pull it back to, uh, I would like to, um, so I think, you know, um, so if we had any questions, if not, uh, I'd like to go to the comments section on the spec. Can you see my spec? Can you see the document? No, you're not sharing. No, oh, okay, let me see how, how to oh, share screen, sorry. Now, can you yep. see? Yep, now we can. Okay, good, okay. So let's go through this comment. Uh, I think we addressed some comments in the last, uh, um, in the last meeting. Um, so let, let me first go to the meeting minutes. So the, um, the here is not, not hero. Uh, I think you have a comment saying, in order to express sequence of function execution for each parallel branch, sequence of function execution, each parallel branch, two dimensional would be a powerful action field rather than a single dimensional array. Okay, so could you clarify a little bit on that, uh, not, not, not hero? Yes. Okay, so let me go through here. I think you have this. Uh, I think that we have this action here, right? Hold on, just here. Um, no, these are those are examples. Um, are you talking about this or where's your comment? Uh, here. Oh, oh, here. Okay, good. Uh, my comment is just, uh, uh, I made a similar comment and uh, this is just one of them. And uh, after the last meeting, and uh, uh, Luis, Luis uh, commented to me and uh, two-dimensional array is not enough. There is a case which two-dimensional uh, array is not enough. And, uh, and I agree, agree with uh, that. And uh, Can you expand the comment from uh, the right hand side? The right hand side? Yes. This one? Uh, Give me your comment. Yes, maybe, maybe above that. Uh, so uh, you say you asked me to expand? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, here. Oh, yes. okay. Yes. Oh, oh, here. Okay. I see. So I think. Uh, uh, basically, I I didn't fully understand how to use the array of action. The, the first of all, I felt that uh, there was an inconsistency between sequential and and uh, and parallel. The, in case of parallel, there is a, it seems to me there is no way to express the sequence in the branch of uh, parallel. So uh, that, that is the reason I commented the last time, but uh, uh, Luis San said uh, there is uh, another case. For instance, uh, the parallel branch can have parallel action inside. So uh, the after, 
the coming back to the Russia, I, I thought that we need a way to create a next state. So, okay. so that, you're... Is the, yes, that is the last state of my comment. So two-dimensional array is not enough. I think we need to allow to create a nested state. Okay, so your suggestion is we, we need to have nested state yes. to handle the complicated uh, function combination, yes. something like that, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, we, I think we can think about this. Um, yeah, well, this is Louis. Uh, I, I, you saw my comment there. I think we've got various options in terms of being able to uh, represent uh, a, a combination of uh, parallel and sequential actions. So we can certainly explore those options. Okay. Any other comment on this? So you, I think your case is, you know, okay, so you give some example, right? So if we are looking at parallel action in parallel states, such as A, B, C, so A, B, C, D, parallel. Okay. So, so you mean is A, B, C, D is executed in parallel. These are four functions, right? This is what you mean by four functions, right? Yes. And then later, after these four functions are completed, there's another two function executed in parallel. Is that what you mean? Yeah, actually, this example is provided by Louis Sang. So uh, it's better to ask, ask him to explain the, the I think, example. I think this is also one of the places where it's easy to define a few constructs, but later realize that they are not flexible enough. So, uh, for instance, uh, you know, the parallel composition, we definitely need things like timeouts. We definitely need, need things like, um, in all use cases, we see cases where in a parallel composition, there are branches that are may and branches that are must, right? That means you're trying to do different things in parallel. Some of them have to succeed before you can continue. Others you're willing to sacrifice if they don't finish on time. Um, but that's, that's one example. We have, we have maps where uh, the, the parallel tasks are the same, but the data is different as opposed to having different, you know, and as opposed to having the dual where you have the same data but different tasks. So there are lots of, lots of ways to build parallel constructs. And I think it's important to try to extract what are the primitive operations on them. Uh, and part, you know, what, what's the forking semantics, the joining semantics, for instance, might be one way to do it. Another thing we also see in some of your most advanced use cases, and maybe I'll add that to the document, is sometimes you fork two, to, you, you, you have a flow of execution, then it forks into two separate tasks. And then one of these tasks further forks into two separate tasks. But the, the order in which you want to join the tasks that you've forked is not the order in which you fork the tasks. So if you only have these constructs that are you know, matching beginning and ends of a parallel composition, then you cannot express that. So that's, that's one place where I think there's a Maybe uh, maybe maybe you can post uh, you know on um, what you just said in this document yes, so to see whether you know it's you know this existing you know this whether we need to expand it or we, we do this as, 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 yeah as we do as this as see. Um, for example here we have you know different match criteria and retry we have here. and this uh, for different functions right so different function result you know based on the different function result. Like, you know, if the function execution is, you know, different, this is an array. So different result could have different retry, separate independent retry mechanism. Um, yeah, I've seen that. I, I don't think this is exactly the same thing, but I, especially I make sure there's been no change to what I've read. I have what I'm talking maybe, about. Okay, so so it would be good because we have limited time. Uh, it would be good if you can post comments on or the which one you think you know this will or cannot handle it, that would be great. Okay. Or maybe I, I okay. Or or if people would like to discuss here, I, I'm 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 okay. So um I think you know you mentioned the, the uh, can you have a specific example, say which which we're talking about, which you think you know uh, this cannot handle? Yes, yes, I'll add to the document. Oh, offline. 
Oh, okay. Okay, that would be good. Um, so this for this one. Um, so I see, you know. Um, so he, here, um, on, I think you know. I'm trying to see whether um, any other people have any comments on this. Kathy. Yes. Uh, can I move to the bottom? Uh, I'd like to hear the other person's opinion of the one to one and six. Okay, so so sorry, I didn't quite get you. Would like me to move to what? Um, to the move to the another topic. Can I talk to another topic? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh huh. The the I'd like to I'd like to hear other persons other people's opinion in terms of the the bottom the section one of one of six. The bottom. Oh yeah. here. Okay, yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay, I see. So input and output processing. So yeah, what... it seems to me the current draft. Missing how to compose the the previous function, the output to the current function's input. So, so I I think uh, we need to specify like uh, Amazon state language. Uh, I, I don't uh, I don't I don't think that uh, Amazon state language is uh, good, but. Uh, just an example. I agree this is an important question. And the way we've done it is to permit writing small pieces of code that gets run in line that doesn't have to be declared as function, but running between the function invocation. And an interesting question is what the language in which to write this function. And um, so Amazon has a specific, you know, JSON path way to specify JSON paths. Mm -hmm. I think in general, uh, we can have a, something like JQ, for instance, to specify these things. What we do for now is to use JavaScript or Python to specify these things, but there are drawbacks to making these, these, uh, these input-output adapters too flexible, because if they are very flexible, then uh, running them safely um, requires a lot of sandboxing, a lot of uh, runtime resources that can be avoided if this is a more specialized language. So, so here, um, um, now here, I think you would like to. So here, what you mean is to see how the uh, do you mean the how the information is passed from um, one function to the next function? Is that yes. what you? Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's actually okay. Let me try to see whether I can clarify. That's in here. Um, so let me see whether uh, filter. Okay, so where is that? Action. Um, no, not this one. Um, state. Oh, okay. Let me see. Kathy, while while you look for it, I just have like a question. So yeah. this does seem like a like a pretty notable problem. I hadn't thought about it before. Mm -hmm. um, sorry for not reading all the way to the bottom of the doc, and. So like, I'm wondering, is this something that the spec needs to handle? Or is this something that like every implementation can handle? Mm -hmm. What do people think of that? You mean the, the, the information passing from one function to the next? Yeah. How do we make sure that we get the type that we expect from the last function? Oh, OK. So actually, um, on the, I think that this is an important point. So information passing from one function to another function also, information passing from the event, uh, event information could be the payload, the metadata to the function. I think these two we all need to address. I think I put it here, but I cannot. Maybe I didn't put it in. Okay, I, I'm going to put it in, and then later people can see whether that works. Yeah, is that, it, is it, that what you want? What you is that we are in sync in terms of the problem? Yeah, in addition to event to event and uh, function to function. Also, uh, we need to, a way to reconcile state to state, I think. And so, okay, so, in, so let me write it down. Information passing um, from 
event to function to function. Let me see. Need to address mm -hmm. hero hero Rachel. Information passing from event to function from between functions, right? Yeah, between function and between state. Between state, very good. Yeah, between function and uh, between state. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can post that. Uh, maybe I, I I forgot to post that. How we do this? You know, information passing from event to function between functions and uh, between states. Yeah. Okay. And specifically, good. and specifically, like, what do we do if it's not the thing that we expect to get? Yeah. Since since Oliver, Oliver, are you still here? How does OpenWhisk handle that? Like, if you are composing things and you get something that you don't expect. All right. So, yeah. So, so we, so we, we first we follow from the OpenWhisk convention. So, um, in OpenWhisk, what every function produces a JSON dictionary. So either this JSON dictionary is a field name error or not. If it doesn't, that's considered to be a normal result. If it does, that's considered to be an abnormal result. So if you have a, the example I was showing earlier, for instance, if you have a normal result, then you execute the same sequence after with the output of the previous function being the input of the next. If the, if the output object contains a field called error, then we jump to the error handler which is the thing we introduce with try catch constructs. So, so error handling is, and the error handler is written by the developer themselves. So you yes. don't do any like state changes. Well, we, we have a, let's say we have a standard library and we have a growing standard library where you can have predefined behaviors in particular, not so much for error handling, but for retries, for instance, where we have a, in the standard library, there's a retry n times, for instance, that says, okay, if I get an error, that means I'm going to retry the call one more time and with the exact same parameters as the first time, right? And you can be more of, of things of that kind. So, so uh, let me. Uh, okay, I think let me address this uh, quickly. So, for the for the um, for this um, um, the error, if the function has an error, we have it here. Say, uh, it's a it's a retry. So here is a um, it's a retry mechanism, uh, which say you know you the function result match what value. And then you are going to do the retry. For the fun information passing, it doesn't matter if the user just say, okay, I want information passed from this function to the next function or from an event to a function or from between the states. It, it has a filter mechanism. Say what, which part of the information, whether it's a, it's a function result or it is a previous uh, event, is, is a previous state, uh, information from previous state or is information from the event we all first apply a filter, you know, because you, you might not want to pass all the information, right? You might want to pass a specific um, info, a specific part of the information field. So there's a filter there. Of course, if the filter, if you have no filter, that means all the information you want to pass to the, either the next state or to the next function. Um, so there's a filter there. And then there's, a, uh, after apply that filter, uh, you know, the information is passed to the next function or to the next, uh, um, um, to the next state. Uh, I think, you know, that that's how it, you know, the user specify, you know, uh, specify it. Um, but maybe um, I forgot to put that information here, but definitely this can be addressed. I'm going to post it next, uh, post it to the document and then you can take a look um, to see whether that makes sense. Um, any other? Thanks. Go ahead, Rachel. Oh, just that, that sounds great. Happy to like chime in on that. On the okay, doc. sure. Thanks. Any other comment? We're running out. We'll have one more minute. Yeah, not, I, I'd like to say one thing. I made a similar comment uh, in the graph and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, really some uh, commenting uh, back to me, and if someone uh, has a uh, other comment, it, it's very welcome to me. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, just uh, I'll have. I'm happy to. Check. 
Rachel, your your you are broken. Your voice is broken. Oh, okay. Yeah, now I might, it's I might not have a way around that right now, but um, I'll chime in on those things. Okay, great. I think that's all. You know, please feel you know free to post comments. I think that that will help us. You know, make this slide better. Um, so I think in the next meeting, we are going to uh, mostly just concentrate on addressing, you know, all these different um, comments to see how we can improve this document. Sounds good? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, with that, we can, I think we are, we are done for this uh, meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.